Good evening, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us on today's lecture on climate change in arts. Before we get started, just let me briefly introduce ourselves. This is Christine. I'm Mark. We are biologists. We are holding a degree in ecology and conservation biology. But so far, we have never worked as biologists uh, because we have turned or become professional photographers, filmmakers, and writers. Uh, with a focus on conservation photography, whatever this means, Christine will tell you a little bit more uh, over the course of this lecture. But um, we've, we understand ourselves as kind of the PR agents of nature that uh, try to bridge the gap between science and the public. So we kind of mediate the stories that are uh, scientist stories, conservation stories, and try to communicate them to a broader audience. And this might be the reason why we have uh, invited for today's lecture. And we'll give you a brief insight into our, uh, the latest projects that we have worked on, our approach towards um, visual storytelling, let's put it that way. And uh, we hope that you can um, use some of our inputs for your own projects. So, I would say let's get started with today's lecture on, on visual storytelling. And I think we'll share, we'll share the screen with you. Then... Because we're currently in a Zoom meeting with ourselves, more or less, because unfortunately we cannot be present physically this evening. So we have recorded this lecture up front, but we hope you're enjoying it nevertheless. So let's get started with the first slide properly. Right there we go, and we'll just um, well take us out from the picture so you can fully focus on on our lecture. Well, hello again, also from myself. As Mark has introduced ourselves, we are conservation photographers, and visual storytelling is what we would like to talk about today because visual storytelling really is what our work is all about. So what really does it symbolize or what is it all about? It's a tool in conservation photography um, that helps you to bring across a message. And basically, if you put it shortly, if you put it into a few words, I would translate it as photography with a message. So it is not just, and that is really important about conservation photography and visual storytelling, it is not just about the very beautiful images, they're part of it in, in a way, but really it is about photography with a meaning. It is about images that convey a message. And in general, when we talk now about visual storytelling, it usually, not always, but it usually is not about a single image, but about a set of images that is constituted by, we call it so-called key images that can even tell the whole story in one image and by contributing images that add additional aspects to the story. Mark is going to tell about this in, in a moment, a bit more in detail and giving you an example on this. Because we would like to show you from our work, um, an example of how this can be put into practice, but also over the lecture, we would like to give you insights into how you can apply these tools for climate change topics. Our topics really are more focused on big predators, but basically it's just, well, you can use it either way. So what really is important when you try to come up with visual storytelling is that you need a story. There is a saying among conservation photographers that you can't tell a story without a story. And where do you get the stories from? Most importantly, you should roam the internet to get basic information of your topics and hand like when we stick with climate change you would want to have a thorough background to know your topic well or to know at least what climate change is all about but here comes the most or one of the most important messages climate change itself if this is what you're interested in is not your story it really is just a topic that engulfs many stories so what you need to do is to unravel the subtopics or the stories that can be found within climate change. 
So a really important thing is that you should not think too big or think about climate change as a story to tackle, but rather think about maybe the farmer that has started to grow particular grain that is adapted to drought or heat conditions, or think about forestry managers that have come up with means of creating a forest that is resilient for future challenges. So think about subtopics. This is important to really come across or find topic that you can talk about. Also, it's important that you have a kind of connection to this topic. If it is something that you just don't like or cannot relate to, then I'm sure you're not going to be able to tell a compelling story. And then again, as I said, do your research on the internet, but do not fool yourself into kind of picking up a story that you learned from the internet or that you found on the internet, because when you find a topic or a story, more importantly, on the internet, then it has already been told. For finding your topic or your story, what you need to do is you need to go out on the street, more or less, or when you talk about conservation photography, you need to go out into the field, you need to connect to the people, you need to go into the forest. That is where you will find the stories, where you will see what is happening in the nature. And even before you grab your camera, this is all stuff that happens before you take the first image, you need to do further research, or let me put it that way, further networking, because the better your network, the better your story is going to be. Find the scientists that work on the particular topic or story that you would like to present. Find nature institutions or other organizations that can help fund your project, and also find the locals and other people who may possibly, or other companies who may possibly help you to spread the word and to spread the message. Because going public will, in the end, wrap up your whole work process and is crucial as well as is the photography. So now I'll be handing over to Mark, who's going to give you a more in-depth insight of what I just talked to you about, what this practically means, and how we apply this in the work that we have pursued over the past years. So like Chris, as Christine mentioned, we were uh, kind of interested in big predators and um, the coexistence with people. So that was the, the, the basic idea. And of course, when you think of brown bears, you immediately think of Alaska, uh, Canada, Russia, or maybe Finland, but you won't necessarily think of Central Europe. So this was kind of the, the starting point of uh, digging deeper into our story of coexistence. And we realized quite quickly after doing our research that there are certain areas in Central Europe, like in Southern Slovenia, where you have a, a huge amount of brown bears living side by side with people. And it seems as if there are no, no um, bigger problems uh, with this, co uh, with this uh, coexistence as we know it from Austria. Because as you might know, in Austria, there's uh, quite anti-approach, if you put it that way, towards big predators such as bears, wolves, and lynx. So it was basically our first step to drive down to southern Slovenia and meet a bunch of people like scientists, shepherds, hunters, and beekeepers that can really tell stories of their own lives and their own bear stories. And these were the second um, starting point, basically, for the next um, bigger uh, um, for the next big step to set up the whole project. So after finding the story itself, after bringing up all these personal attitudes and the personal approaches toward, towards big predators, it was our next um, step to find partners for this project. Partners in terms of scientific partners, official partners like the European Union with the Life Dinal Bear project that was going on right about that time when we started the Bear project, like summer 2015. Um, we tried to um, get all those stakeholders in our boat, like national or international national parks in Austria and in Slovenia, locals like local bear specialists, like Slovenian bears, and of course also technical partners such as Canon. We are photographers and we have always used Canon cameras. So we asked Canon Austria 
to, to help with technical equipment and, and printing partners also already uh, keeping in mind that we need to uh, bring our photographers uh, to our photographs uh, into the general public. So we had a whole bunch of partners, cooperation partners, funding partners to get everything started. And the third step was uh, to go into the field and produce those images that were really unique. If you think of pairs like mentions, uh, mentioned, it's mainly about North America, but we wanted to produce images that were unique in that way that you could see immediately that they were taken in Central Europe like in this case, where you have a, a young bear roaming a morning in a Central European, typical Central European landscape. So that would be, uh, uh, would be one of the key issues to produce images that are unique. Second step in photography was to produce images that tell, that basically tell the whole story in just one, in this one image, like this bear that's almost roaming a village. So you could see from this image immediately it's in Europe and it's close to a village and there is a bear. That would be something that freaks out certain um, Austrians probably, but in Slovenia that's quite common. So that would be um, one of the key issues to produce images that tell the whole story at once, like um, with this bear family that's literally um, looking for food in a garden. So like the backyard bear, basically. And it was just by chance that we um, photographed this bear family and this cute little bear cup was looking straight towards the camera. So it's basically looking straight towards us. And that brings up another very important aspect of uh, visual storytelling, um, which are emotions. And Christine will tell you a little bit more about emotions. Yeah, it needs emotions, or it's good to have emotions, like in this case, in such a key photograph that tells the whole story, practically of coexistence between bears and people in, as bears roam these gardens here close to a village. But it also takes or needs, or it takes images that convey emotions from animal babies, for example. If there's any chance you can photograph uh, little animals, then you should always go for it because the person who looks at it will immediately be touched. It will steer emotions and it will help to pave the way for transmitting the message that you would like to transmit, such as the message that coexistence is possible. We have used photojournalistic approaches in our project a lot where we portray people and especially those people who work in close proximity potentially to bear habitat, which are, as in this case, livestock farmers, or more precisely, these are sheep herders with a livestock guardian dog, that is the white dog um, on the photograph, and herding dogs as well, that are protecting or they're representing the means that are already present to protect the livestock, the sheep in the background, from potential bear attacks. So these are images as well that we would want to show where there is a connection to the human world that this is not a topic that is related only to the wildlife, but that there is a connection. And the whole thing is about coexistence between big predators or brown bears and people. So you have to show the people, of course, as well. And you have, as I mentioned it in the beginning, you have to show also those images that most likely might steer negative emotions or might be shocking for some who look at these or at this photo. It is not just about the beautiful images. Bear this in mind, it is also about images that really bring the attention to the conflict potential or to the very topic that you want to address. So if you want to address bear hunting, then you cannot only or simply show a cute little baby bear, but you also have to show the bear that has been shot just recently because hunting in some areas in Central Europe is still a topic and very controversially because there would be other means and other options to decrease conflict potential between livestock, for example, and big predators such as brown bears. So you're trying to accumulate this set of images as you've seen here and together they will be 
able to communicate and to tell your whole story. But a very important message from us really is that once you've accumulated your photographs, do not let them kind of rot away more or less in your archive, but you have to dig them out, compile them and make them available to a larger audience. And the larger audience can be found in different media outlets. And here I'll show you an overview of all the outlets that we've used for our BEAR projects and that has enabled us to reach a large audience to spread the message that is dear to us, which is that coexistence between brown bears and people is possible. So very clearly, when you have photographs, you want to get them printed. So you will address different magazines and newspapers or even think about producing a book if it's a larger project, as in our case, that has lasted over several years and yielded a lot of photographs. And I would really urge you and ask you to think as big as you can. Do not refrain from getting in touch with those big names, with those established magazines, such as National Geographic, where we manage, for example, to place our bear story, or other big names um, in the German-speaking world, like uh, Geo, Geo, Germany, for example, or BBC Wildlife, a British magazine, a well-established one. Try to go big, but at the same time, don't refrain or don't forget to go small, more or less, uh, because small is just as important as going big, because you don't just want to spread your message as far as possible, but you want to have it seep into those very population areas or into those um, stakeholder uh, areas that are most affected, which is especially in our case, for example, hunters and livestock farmers. So aim at these stakeholder groups and at their magazines and media outlets to spread the message as well. So try both, go big and go small, more or less uh, at the same time. Of course, when talking about photographs, exhibitions are important as well. Many people, however, only think about indoor exhibitions. At current times, outdoor is getting more and more interesting, especially with the current COVID situation or unfortunately, but um, we thought, or we always thought that outdoor is a great way of displaying and presenting your photographs and making it accessible to a larger public, especially when you deal with wildlife and nature conservation topics. So, just with uh, the example of our bear outdoor presentation and exhibition, uh, this one has traveled uh, several countries so far and is moving onwards since it's been produced uh, over four years ago, more or less, from one place to the next. And this is also what you would like to yield. You would like to have a sustainable use of your material. So one exhibition once printed can be used many times and especially if you have it of course indoor as well but outdoor ones can travel uh, very far and can be used in many locations and even at current times when you have a pandemic for example. At times of a pandemic live talks are kind of a problem. We consider live talks to be really important because it is a combination of multimedia aspects of photography, of film, of music, and of the message that you want to convey. And you can, as well as with the photographs, also steer emotions with the combinations of all of these media tools. And for this, it is really advisable to go, just as with the print publications, go big and go small, small at the same time. We appreciate both. We've used or uh, got in touch and presented at all sorts of international photography festivals and conservation festivals ranging from Spain, France, Germany to Belgium, and of course as well in Austria, since this is where we wanted to um, get the topic to the attention of most people. But we also got in touch with schools and with local communities, with libraries where there were maybe roughly only a few people in the audience or just uh, a lot, um, well, in comparison to the large festivals, of course, fewer people but it is really important to go there as well. And especially to go to the schools where you have the kids future, um, our future um, in there and where you can place your important messages to place the seeds that can later on unfold. And eventually, of course, websites, uh, building your own website, especially if you have a larger project, 
that you would like to present and being present on social media is something that is more or less state of the art nowadays. We, however, don't consider it to be the starting point. It is something that is an add-on that is kind of necessary nowadays, but I think and would most importantly urge you to not solely think about website and social media, media and internet uh, and digital presence, but to have it as a foundation to build up upon and to really go into uh, those topics or into those media outlets that, um, well, that can go into a more direct approach uh, or can access the audience more directly. So let's move on to <laughs> how you can convey a message um, not necessarily with long-term projects. Yeah, we were just talking about our bear project, and this was in fact extremely time-consuming and lasting for several years. But with this Lynx lady that we achieved to photograph back in 2016, in, in October, November 2016, um, we have proven that conservation photography can also work with just a single image. Like, uh, in this case, it was in fact one of the first high resolution images of a lynx captured in the Alps, which is quite special, but it doesn't make a whole conservation story. But we achieved this image at the best time we could think of in terms of lynx conservation, because it was back in autumn 2016, when two cases or the two latest cases of poaching went to court in Upper Austria. So together with Na uh, National Park Kalgarten, where this image was, was captured, um, we made up a huge conservation campaign, bringing Skadi, which is this lynx lady, um, to the attention of more than 1.4 million people across the whole country, via newspapers, magazine articles, radio interviews, and television interviews. And this is not just to show off, but to give you an idea of what is possible. So just one single image of one animal made a huge impact on conservation back in 2016. So we hope to give you uh, an idea of what is, what is possible. Mm -hmm. And what really is important about this is that you make the picture matter. It could, the picture could have gone completely unnoticed, but if you make an effort and if you Get in touch with all the media outlets then you can really make your image shine and not the image necessarily but really what lies beyond the conservation aspect i guess that's how we can wrap it up but eventually you might be waiting for hints on how to communicate climate change because this is the very core of this lecture series of course and we do not want to close our lecture without pointing out or providing a few hints and ideas on how you could put this into action. And what is really crucial about climate change and to know before you come up with a story that you're trying to tell is that it is in fact hard to visualize by its nature because it stretches over long periods of time. So the very question is what can you do to grab people's attention nevertheless to make climate change and climate change actions Meta. So we, we have a look here um, at a very typical scenario situation, but there's more to the picture than you immediately see here. And let me briefly point out what I mean about this. Besides short term projects, um, and I mentioned in the beginning that you should not go for climate change in general, but look for subtopics that have a smaller scope and that are more accessible to people than the all over huge and global topic, you should nevertheless or not completely forget about the long-term aspects about climate change and their means of visualizing these. For example, by visiting a certain location or the very same location one year after the other to produce images from the very same spot and thereby compare the difference or how compare how a landscape or an ecosystem has changed over time and give the viewer an idea of how these places have undergone changes affected by climate change. 
apart from glaciers, which is the very first thing that you think about uh, when you think about a changing climate, there are a lot of other ecosystems, literally all ecosystems that will or have been affected by climate change. You could as well look at forests as they are under the pressure of a continuously drier and hotter climate. Or you can also just look at cultivated land and how it changes over time. You can literally take any single ecosystem that is out there and look at it over a series of many years or even over um, a year. You can sort of take a series of images um, every single month, for example. That depends largely on how fast the ecosystem changes. And that depends a lot on your observation of what would be best to depict the change in this certain scenario. Also, if you're running a campaign, you do not necessarily need to be a photographer yourself uh, for what we are suggesting here. But if you're running a campaign on climate change, you could also dig through archives looking for historical pictures and aim at recreating these images nowadays to compare how much of a difference is there to a historical image. So there's really a diversity of options, how you can visualize and, and do visual storytelling with historical or earlier images and images that have been created over certain years or as years have passed by. Ourselves, we have noticed climate change more or less, or at least a change in climate uh, on our travels in northern Scandinavia, for example. The climate walk, which will start in Scandinavia, will start right there where places are most affected by climate change. And here, for example, this is the very same location photographed in different years, but in different scenarios. On the right-hand side, you can see what happens if the snow is getting less and less. And on the right-hand side, this is just, on the left-hand side, sorry, this is a picture that has been taken just a few years before on the very same location. So. Snow is getting less, temperatures are getting higher, and if you create an image like this constituting of two images, this brings a strong message to the people. And both images were taken in February. So February 2015 on the left and 2018 on the right, and you can see immediately that there is a big difference in snow amount and temperature. Absolutely. When talking about climate change, there is also one aspect I would like to address your attention to. It is a very new and progressive approach to conservation, which is called rewilding. Rewilding is actually aiming at reviving ecological processes and also at restoring connections that have been lost, connections between all sorts of species, varying from animals to plants, but also to humans. We are a part of rewilding. And this approach is really and seriously engulfing not just nature but also humans and aiming at finding or harmonizing our relationship within, with, between ourselves and nature. And what you can do again from a campaign aspect or also from a photography aspect from a visual storyteller's perspective is to show what happens if we disregard this connection with nature. Again by showing two pictures at the same time by juxtapositioning a picture of a mismanaged forest, we have to say, by uh, humans on the left-hand side, a managed forest, and on the right-hand side, a picture of a pristine forest. This is what Central Europe or what most of Europe could look like if we hadn't interfered. And of course, this is nothing which will be happening in the foreseeable future again, that all of Europe is going to be covered in pristine forest again but it is an image that shows us that there is a possibility in between the extremes. And this is where we should be heading. We should be aiming at finding or at restoring nature to a level where it can fulfill all its ecosystem functions yet again. And this is true as well for rivers, where you can contrast these two very differently flowing rivers again. And spreading the message to the people out there that uh, climate change is nothing that is secluded from other aspects of nature and species conservation, but all of this is really interconnected. And as ecosystems become more resilient, so will they be 
more able to tackle and more able to adapt to all changes that have been or are going to be affected by climate change. So this is something that I would like to place at your heart that you consider how rewilding can make a difference for your climate change story. And in the end, it really is all about the people. We cannot, and rewilding stresses this, leave out the people and we cannot convey the message that nature comes first and then people only second or even somewhere else. It really goes together. And for the climate walk itself, but also for other campaigns and activities, what you could do to unite people who are spread over a larger distance, for example, for the climate walk, you're really, you're really, well, crossing a large distance from all north, uh, northern Europe towards the southern uh, coast of Portugal. To connect these people, you could come up with a campaign where, for example, you ask all people that you come across, and it may be hundreds of people, to pose for pictures, either as a portrait or when they do their work, and kind of come up with a unified message. This can be something that you print into the photo, or you can actually physically carry a signboard with you. We suggested to label it with together for a stable climate. You could label it with any other unifying message, but carry and transport a unifying message. And with a mass of people that are supporting this message, you will also get a more positive approach or a more positive feedback from the public towards these topics and particularly climate change for many people has the feeling that it's something that we have to deal with and it would be so nice or ever so nice to enable people to see it from the perspective of, of potential that we can really co-create our future and that all of us have an impact on how we can create a future that is truly sustainable. And so we would urge you to get active and to become visual storytellers yourself, no matter if you physically grab the camera or if you are a campaigner or if you are an artist of any other sort, there are so many means of getting active. And we hope that within this very short time frame, we have given you at least a few ideas on how you could become creative yourself and find means of making nature and making climate matter. Well, if you have an idea, make sure to reach out and, and get your message, message spread. And, and we hope that we have kind of motivated you to just to shout it out. So <laughs> keep it up. We, we wish you all the best for your own ideas and your own campaigns. And we hope that we have given you a, a short insight into professional campaigning and um, to, to assure you that there are several media outlets that will, will definitely be happy to tell your story. Yeah, well, thanks very much. Thanks. In case you have any questions, unfortunately we're not here tonight, but um, just, um, Drop us an email and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank bye you. bye. Bye bye.